Hello, everyone, and welcome to Not at the Museum Thursday night. I'm Sylvia. I'm one of the assistant curators here at the Niagara Falls History Museum. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, as usual, we will, we will begin our night with our land acknowledgement. The Niagara region of Ontario is located on the shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Chinatown people. The Chinatown people have called this land their home for thousands of years, and until recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing this land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. Tonight, we have part two of Voices Lost in Crisis. Our speaker again this evening is Dr. Laura Mullins, Assistant Professor in the Department of Applied Disability Studies. Uh, she's joined by her team tonight who are gonna be sharing their, their stories and their accounts. Um, you'll notice uh, again on Zoom, we have a Q&A feature. So if you have any questions for Laura or her team, please feel free to type in your questions in that section. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can leave comments on Facebook. I'll be checking those and letting the team know. So I won't take up any more of your time. I'm sure everyone's anxious to hear what everyone has to say. So Laura, please take it away. Thank you so much. We are very excited to be back here again to share the results of our Voices Lost in Crisis, um, listening to the lived experience of adults with intellectual disabilities during the COVID pandemic. There we go. So I just wanted to introduce our team again. So um, our co-investigator on the project was Ma Dr. Maureen Connolly, um, another professor in uh, Brock University. We also have Courtney Bishop, who is a PhD student, and Mackenzie Strong and Charity Blaine also were research assistants on the project. We also like to give a special thanks to the Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences for providing us with the funds to be able to, to conduct this powerful research. We had 13 participant collaborators that worked with us on this project um, that included seven, nine females and four males ranging in ages from 25 to 47. They had a variety of different diagnoses, including intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, as well as some autism, Down syndrome, and cerebral palsy. Participants were from all over Ontario and lived in rural and urban regions, and were living in a various different types of living arrangements. Some lived with their uh, families in their family home. Others were supported independently uh, in the community in apartments. And we had two um, cohabiting couples that lived together. We are very excited to have several of our participants with us today uh, to share, to actually share their experiences with you. So you get to hear from, from them instead of just from us. So I'm, I'm really excited to introduce Damien and Tara. Do you wanna turn your camera on and your, your mic on and say hello to everyone? Hello. Hello, welcome. We also have Ashley. Hi. There she is, hello. Crystal. I'm trying to get it to work. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it won't let me start my video. It's just saying cannot start video. Be oh, start video now. Okay. Um. Yep. Okay. There you are. Yep. So I'm Hello. Crystal. And it's the day and Lana. Hi. Hello, and welcome Hi. back. And we'd also like to give a special shout out to Shannon and Irene who are with us in the audience today, as well as Lori, who's also watching us. So why did we conduct this research? We thought it was really important to get a better understanding of how COVID-19 has particularly impacted the lives of adults with intellectual disabilities. We really wanted to do this 
project to get a better understanding of um, what are some of the challenges that they've been experiencing, for example, associated with social isolation, mental health, and how has that impacted their overall quality of life? We really want to raise awareness of areas of resilience um, and help other people understand what it was like to live during the pandemic for these individuals, as well as to identify some barriers and challenges that were they experienced that need to be addressed at larger social uh, levels through changes to policy and procedures. Last week, we spent a great deal of time talking about the research methodology. Just to, as a real recap, we used a photo voice method where participants are collaborators in the entire research process. We chose photo voice because it's a very accessible meeting, medium, as well as it allows individuals to take pictures um, of things that are occurring in their real life, their challenges, um, their successes, to really illustrate what it's like to live during the pandemic. Participants took pictures that um, reflect, reflected their lived experiences. They record, recorded their, their thoughts in, in, in a journal. We also met with them and use those images as prompts during interviews to further contextualize and describe what their life was like. And then we are pulling it all together and sharing it with excerpts um, from their journals, from some of the check-ins, from some of our meetings, um, to really provide a, a rich description of what it's been like for these individuals. So there were several phases to this process, as I kind of just mentioned. Um, we made sure that we got consent from the participants themselves. And we used a variety of different strategies and techniques to make sure that each individual was able to provide their own informed consent to the project. We did a preliminary needs assessment to make sure that we were tailoring all of the supports to, to each of these individuals. Uh, as part of the funds, we were also able to provide all the participants with a Samsung um, tablet to be able to take pictures and to participate in the research. If they didn't need a tablet, then they were given the cash value as a thank you for their, for their meaningful contributions. We also were able to provide them with some PPE and a journal to keep track of everything. To begin the research in order to make sure that everybody was on board and fully appreciated and fully kind of decided the research um, questions, we had several different training sessions. The first we reviewed the research process and also talked about um, pandemic safety. Um, at the second training, we talked about obtaining consent to make sure that the individuals were um, getting informed consent of other individuals that they might be taking pictures of so that we can share them publicly with everyone. We had one of our research assistants was a photographer and she spent a nice uh, great deal of time helping individuals learn how to take really good images, how to stage it, how to express emotion through their video, through their photography. And then we spent some time talking about journaling and how to keep track of really important things so that they didn't lose that um, um, after they had taken the images. We've had the photography for about an eight week period, at which point we were doing bi-weekly check-ins as a team um, on Teams um, to kind of share how things were going, to share some of the images and share ideas with everyone. And then after that, we um, had the participants narrow down, unfortunately narrow down to three pictures to focus on during the interview. And we had to ask them questions to talk about what it was like for them. We did a collaborative data analysis where we had the participants join us in trying to start to, to organize and figure out what are some of the major areas or major themes that were um, evident in their lived experiences. And then we are sharing the results today in, in this exhibit and we'll be doing some several more in the future. So let's talk about what their lived experiences were. We were able to organize um, what, what their experiences were into six main areas. First was the direct and disproportionate effects of COVID on their lives. We also had a lot of ableist assumptions and how that played out for these individuals. The participants also experienced a great deal of losses associated with social distancing restrictions and the lockdown. 
they had many different changes to their relationships. They also had lots of new opportunities that emerged and were able to demonstrate many different areas of resilience. So we are going to review all of those different areas today. I forgot I was on mute. This keeps happening to me. <laughs> so let's start just by chatting a little bit about the direct and disproportionate effect of COVID-19. Um, so once we were kind of finished the project, we came together as a group and um, these themes that we're presenting with you today are themes that have been put together by um, you know people from Brock, but also from the research participants themselves. Uh, one of the primary ones that came out was this um, recognition that all of us, uh, disability or not, have been impacted by um, the restrictions and things that have gone as a result of COVID-19. But what we are seeing is that there seems to be a disproportionate effect of COVID-19 um, on individuals in particular with disabilities. So these restrictions that we're all experiencing um, seem to have more of an effect on individuals themselves. Um, so for instance, you know, not being able to have in-person uh, appointments that's difficult if you have, you know, different forms of communication. Um, higher risk of mental health needs in this population have been exacerbated by COVID-19 itself, um, or having an increased risk as a result of certain complex needs. So a number of different um, disproportionate effects that are being felt by this population right now. And that wasn't really anything different for our participants. And they're gonna talk about that a little bit further. So as you can see here, we have two um, quotes from some of our participants uh, who are both here today. Um, I will just uh, open it up to them, but in general, just remembering that participants had a higher risk of getting COVID-19 than the general population because of a number of their own complex medical needs. Damien, Tara, do you wanna read this quote out loud for us? Maybe talk a little bit about it? Um, sure, what we said was an illness in our house spreads around pretty quickly. So if COVID comes into our house, we're all going to get it. Um, Damien has a physical disability, as do all three of his other siblings. And so there is no ability to um, isolate someone when they, get, when they get sick. And so illnesses come, or, come into our house and get passed around very quickly. COVID is going to be much worse for Damien and his siblings because it, it tends to have a more severe course than just a common cold. Absolutely. So Dan, Anna? So they had said in one of her interviews that um, if you get COVID, you're coming back and from the hospital. But if I get COVID, I'm not. That was mm -hmm. in the context of the current triage, the healthcare triage system that is in place and some of the acknowledged risks of being medically complex and technologically dependent in our area at this point in history. And it is, it's an informing reality for us that has mm -hmm. informed much of our last 19 months of our lives. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I can tell you that in a number of our interviews, most of us were crying um, just that reality hitting all of us, uh, that there is such a much higher risk for, for this population. Um, Damien also, in one of his interviews, had a really um, impactful discussion just about, um, you know, some of the luxuries that typically developing people might be able to take on during this time. Uh, Damien, Tara, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it back over to you and you guys can maybe chat a little about this a bit further. Sure. Um, what we had said was um, that getting together with other people has become a luxury. The fact that um, this was my sister-in-law had set up the Christmas tree in the driveway and had tried to make it a little bit festival when we came down um, was really nice. We weren't getting together with um, family in person at Christmas last year. Um, as you can see, Damien is still in the van and his siblings are still in the van because, um, because of the safety needed little kids are busy and they move around a lot and sometimes forget um, COVID or not. They're still little kids and they get excited for presents and taking the risk that the cousins were going to get excited and come running over um, was just too great. Um, Damien can't move his wheelchair. So if his cousins started getting too close, 
he wouldn't have been able to move himself away to maintain a safe distance. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the part that really struck us as the luxury is that the rest of the family did get together in person on Christmas. We just had to do it before Christmas and outside on the driveway and not actually be in person with family on Christmas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's got to be incredibly um, frustrating, right? To not be able to, to watch other people taking those risks and you not having the luxury to be able to take the same risks. And we think you're well be at that point this year too. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, this slide here is also a really good reminder of that where you were talking a lot about how, you know, your world seems to continue to get smaller as restrictions kind of lift for everybody else. There doesn't seem to be much of a light at the end of the tunnel for you. Do you want to talk a bit more about that as well? Yeah. Um, this picture we took um, last winter because we go... <laughs> I know we walked there today too, but we go mm -hmm. for this walk every single day. Um, in the winter time, it was probably twice a day. Right now it's probably closer to three times a day. Um, mm -hmm. And being a wheelchair user, normally we would have gone to the mall in the winter. We walked through malls a lot because mm -hmm. you don't have to contend with the cold weather. You don't have to contend with um, people having left garbage cans on their sidewalks or improperly plowed roads and sidewalks. Um, and we found this little route that was consistently shoveled. And so we walked every, every day. Um, instead of going to New York City last summer, we walked through the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I love your statement about how it's like Groundhog Day. I think that paints such an image for people. Yeah, and in the interview, it was 360 days. We're, we're at uh, over 550 days and we're still just going for the same walk. Mm -hmm. And can you maybe speak a little bit, uh, Taryn, Davy, and sorry, just before we skip on. Um, I know that a lot of us um, are taking those additional risks now as we both get vaccinated, um, you know, but you have some circumstances in your house that don't allow that to happen. Um, well, you can see in the picture here that um, Damien and his siblings, um, his sister also uses a wheelchair um, and he has a younger brother. Younger, his younger brother is too young to be vaccinated, um, but he, he also has very damaged lungs. Um, so even getting a cold for his younger brother requires um, oxygen use and tube feeding. So we, we know the very real consequences of what COVID would result in for him. Um, and Damien is also falling into the category of somebody that can receive a third dose of the COVID vaccine um, because of being immunocompromised. Um, and so even though he's had both doses of his COVID vaccine, we don't really know how much protection he actually has. Mm -hmm. So the, the restrictions, the, the precautions that everyone was taking last March in 2020, we're still there. Mm -hmm. With no end in sight. With, yeah, with no end in sight. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thanks for sharing. I think one of the other things that our participants really talked about in terms of this disproportionate effect, um, and it kind of goes in line with what Damien and Tara were talking about, how their, how their world is coming smaller, is also um, having to remain in some of these confined state spaces to keep themselves safe. Um, Ashley, this is a fantastic picture of you here on the left-hand side. Um, do you want to maybe speak a little bit more about your experiences with that? Oh, you're muted. There. Living in an apartment this day and age really does suck. I'm really grateful I do have a home when I'm not sitting on the streets begging or something, but oh my goodness, this sucks. I don't have a green space. Like, actual, well, there, there's grass outside, but like, I have to go down seven floors. Mm -hmm. and people are dirty and don't wash their hands. So I carry sanitizer and use some uh, after I get off the elevator 
And these days, doing lo- going downstairs to do laundry is a treat. Kind of like also, a, I find it also as like a a field trip. Mm-hmm. But at least the jail's got good food. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who were not with us last week, um, Ashley has some zingers, so pay attention. <laughs> they will come out of nowhere. Um, I think, and it, you know, these themes are all obviously very intertwined. Um, and being confined to these spaces and having, you know, an, an exacerbated um, risk and fear around catching COVID and the implications of that have led to people also feeling some extreme amounts of loneliness, which is completely understandable. Um, but when you hear individuals actually talk about it, it's um, really eye-opening from an able-bodied perspective. Um, this is a part of Zade's journal and I'm gonna pass it on over to Zade and ask her to uh, share it with you guys this evening. Oh, I got my coat out on out the window. I could walk. But it's not safe for me to be out with the people walking by and I keep playing on the street. If people call up the room and can they say it won't be my thing. Is it um if not pretty well I could but they do not if I cannot so they don't that I can go outside at all but as much right now. Yeah, you can't exactly, you're not able to go outside right now. So you're kind of watching the world from the inside. And you definitely were not the only person in our group that was feeling this way. I mean, look at these pictures, right? Um, this this is a reality for you guys in that you cannot place yourself at that risk. And it's leading, I think, to some loneliness, right? Not to have those connections that you're used to having. Mm-hmm. And I really love that you speak to the fact that if other people would be responsible and wear their masks, right, that you would have the opportunity to do that. But I think that's part of why we want to be doing this with you guys, right, is to make that out there and get people aware of this so that they understand the implications of their own actions. Thank you for sharing. The other area that we see um, being exacerbated by the COVID-19 is just um, impacts on general mental health. So we know that this has been an impact for everybody on mental health, um, but individuals with different types of disabilities are at higher risk of experiencing mental health um, without a pandemic happening. And so uh, we have seen that within the pandemic, individuals with disabilities are experiencing much higher rates of mental health concerns compared to their able-bodied peers. Um, Krista, you have a fantastic picture here on the left-hand side. Do you want to speak a little bit about it? Yep. So um, this picture is about like how anxiety affects us. Sometimes it weights us down so much that we want to get stuff done and we do want to do stuff, but it's just like a heavy weight of um, like a magnet that doesn't allow us to sometimes. And with this pandemic it has affected us a lot more. Um, at first, I was a person busy going out all the time. You know, I was busy involved with so much. And with the pandemic, you know, I had to, for a while, with not knowing about stuff, we had to stay in a lot more, which is very hard because I don't like to be home and bored. <laughs> for me, it's a lot. So I had to kind of find out creative ways um, to help me to keep busy. Um, and stay safe, but be busy and not feel so down about it. And already Mm -hmm. struggling with some um, losses I was going through already in the pandemic made it even worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was a lot of loss that was felt in the pandemic and we're definitely gonna touch on that a little bit further because it's an important thing to bring up, I think. 
Um, <clears throat> and Crystal, you yep. definitely one of the busiest people I've ever met. <laughs> yeah. um, and as you will see, when we talk about resilience, uh, she has found a way to keep that going. <laughs> um, some of the other things that we saw that were exacerbated by the COVID-19 were inaccessibility. Um, so, you know, as you can see here, we have a picture up at the top. Um, I believe this is Ashley in the right corner, um, having to wear all of the PPE in addition to the other assistive devices such as glasses and having the hearing aids. These are things that, you know, individuals had to take on for themselves to keep themselves safe. Um, Zade, I love this picture of you in the bottom corner. Maybe you can speak a little bit about that as well um, with your journal entry, if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. That's um, okay. This might take not work for me. I know it was designed to me. It was given for people who need to live. She gave someone much it left for me. To I get wake up back to my nose in my mouth. It makes me make it very hard to breathe. I couldn't get it off my trap. It was kind of a change I I you know. In getting air in air out of my life. And that is when my life are as happy as they can be when I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. When one that like brilliant absolutely so, so go ahead sorry. shannon actually with the oh, was um, it hearing aid it was Sh shannon or whatever oh like, thank you yeah that that, that hair was short time <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a lot of issues around inaccessibility um, through this time. It was a very large theme. Uh, one of the other pictures that is on that slide is actually, I believe it's again Zade. Um, it's your outdoor kind of stroller, right? Your wheelchair. Yeah. Um, and just the concern about being able to go out and if there's somebody hasn't shoveled their driveway, it's not like you can go and ask for help if you get stuck this time. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. well, we could, but not in the now world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you used to be able to go out and feel safe if that happened. You could go knock on somebody's door and say, hey, you didn't shovel your driveway or your sidewalk. Come help us. But now you have to take that risk because you can't go to the door and say you need to help me. Yeah. Yeah. Huge implications. Thank you for sharing. There was also a lot of discussion about there being restricted access. Um, so we all felt this. We all were restricted to, um, you know, certain types of healthcare situations or online kind of appointments, for instance. Um, we were restricted in terms of the public locations that we could go to, um, education and programming, as well as some of our non-essential items. Uh, but this was really felt so much more uh, by the individuals that were a part of this project. Um, I'm going to start actually with Ashley this time to chat a little bit about some of that impact of that having those additional restrictions on you. Um, 
having a disability, especially during this time, is super hard. I think like mm-hmm. 1,000 times hard. And I dislike when people are like, oh, everybody's going through a hard time. Not as hard as this. Because I'm waiting. I've been waiting about a year and six months for uh, some parts to my wheelchair so I can act, I don't know, sit up properly. So by the time that rolls around, I'll be eligible for new seating. I'm not even kidding. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, and I think also like people as a healthcare uh, people, like nurses, doctors, they assume that I can push my own manual wheelchair. So I had an appointment probably about a year and a half ago and, and they said, oh, come alone. I'm like, really? Who's going to who's gonna push my wheelchair, Santa Claus? Mm-hmm. I love this quote. This is a fantastic quote. Do you want to read it now? Oh, sure. I had to go for allergy testing because I had a reaction at Christmas time to something we're not sure. And they, as the people at the allergy place, said that I had to come alone. I said, um, but I can't push my own wheelchair. And they sort of went, oh, okay, I guess we can let your dad in. This is as if to say, well, I think this is as if to say, well, I think what I had written in my journal was like, some people don't think it through and it's 100% correct. Like as the me- like medical pr- professionals, nurses, doctors, x-ray techs. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, some of the other areas that restricted access was felt was in, um, say, public locations because of the additional risks with disabilities. So you can see this picture on the bottom left hand corner um, where our participants were not even comfortable getting out of the car to be able to take the picture uh, because of the number of people that were in the lineup um, or Zade. Um, you know, not having access to a therapeutic pool that is really necessary when you have, um, you know, a movement disorder that makes it, you know, you need that warm water to keep your body moving. Um, So, you know, for me, missing out on the therapeutic pools, that nice warm water, I'm sad about it, but the impact that it has on somebody who actually requires that and it has an impact on their day-to-day functioning is so much larger for them than it is for for an able-bodied person such as myself. So you can see Zade here is trying to get that same influence of the warm water, but is having to use a Rubbermaid bin um, to be able to cover themselves in the warm water and help with their muscles. I think this is probably uh, one of the most impactful pieces of uh, COVID-19, something that will come up again as we chat tonight, but there has been a significantly more um, amount of individuals with disabilities who have actually lost uh, their lives as a result of COVID-19. Um, so we know uh, people with such disorders, um, they, can, they can account, sorry, for one in 50 Americans um, on average, more than two and a half times as likely to die from COVID-19. Um, and this is in the U.S., but we're seeing similar rates here as well. So this is an incredible picture um, that one of our participants took to honor the memory of the friends with disabilities that they have lost. Um due to COVID-19 or repercussions of COVID-19. And unfortunately this picture was taken months and months and months ago. And I'm sure that candles have been added to it um, since. Thank you. And one of the saddest things is it's not necessarily that they died directly from COVID, but it's a lot of the ways in which the pandemic had been planned and the rolling out of the um, the testing, the vaccines, and the triage in the hospitals that also influenced the likelihood that they were at an increased uh, risk of mortality associated with the pandemic. And this really leads us to the, the second theme is the ableist assumptions um, that the individuals experienced. And, and um, 
Ashley Zinger there really kind of plays through. So some people just don't think it through. Ableism, similar to other forms of isms, is a systematic discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. It's often expressed in the unquestioned assumption of normality, um, and people just don't think through the implications of their decisions and actions on those that don't conform to that normal type of being. So with regards to the pandemic planning, um, Tara, did you wanna talk a little bit about some of the implications that that had for you and your family? Um, very early on um, in the pandemic, we, we got pretty scared pretty fast. Um, the triage protocols are such that people with disabilities would be given a lower priority for um, resuscitation and life-preserving measures mm -hmm. if they required ICU level care. Um, for our family, particularly, um, Damien is nonverbal, which is why I'm speaking tonight and not him. Um, and adults like Damien were being admitted to hospital with or without COVID. And because of the way um, the, the safety measures had been put in place, caregivers were not, and family were not allowed to accompany anybody into the hospital, including those with very severe disabilities. So if Damien had been hospitalized for any reason, um, I wouldn't have been able to be there with him. He wouldn't have had a voice and um, nobody would have known how to care for him. And because we have children and adult children in our house, um, the fear was if COVID came through our house, our family could potentially be split up. And our Damien's younger siblings at a pediatric hospital and Damien and his other sister potentially at a, a second hospital. Um, and so there was, we were just scared. <laughs> we were just scared. We were scared that COVID would come into our house and take our children, um, we were scared that if any, any family member got sick for any reason, whether it was related to COVID or their disability or some other fluke like <laughs> falling and breaking a leg or getting hit by a vehicle, um, Damien would have been in the hospital by himself. Um, and with all of the resources being used up for um, neurotypical able-bodied patients with COVID, even if Damien had an accident or something unrelated to COVID, he was less likely to actually receive life-sustaining care to allow him to heal from that. Which is why we're still locked in our house. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I honestly, I can't imagine or fathom how scary that must be both for on a living and day-to-day -day basis. Um, trying to manage that and trying to ward against that significant impact. And you can see by Damien's face, he, <laughs> he he's not happy anymore that yeah. now that we're, we're talking about this. He, no, it, it's a pretty serious conversation in our house. Absolutely. And his life does have value. And I think um, another illustration of um, some of that implications is some of the participants in order to get direct support into the house because they needed um, some support for direct care um, and tasks of daily living in order to have the, the staff to be able to come into the house. What actually happened was the participants had to get themselves tested instead of having the staff that are coming and going and coming and going into other people's homes. They didn't have to get tested, but the individual themselves, our participants actually had to. There were a lot, a lot of uh, financial challenges that our participants experienced um, because of the changes and restrictions associated with the funding that they were provided, including how they administered the, the CERB and the impl implications that would have on their ODSP, as well as the way in which passports funding um, had been implemented, as well as some of the changes that that happened. Lena, did you wanna speak to that a little bit? I think for us, the, along with the isolation and the having lost the feeling of being safe, the financial challenges of COVID have been really significant for us. 
because everything has gotten more expensive. We're home more than we've ever been before and having to heat the house more than we had to heat it, cool the house more than we had to cool it. Groceries are more expensive. We can't safely go into the grocery store on our own. So we're having to pay people to go and get our groceries for us. And, uh, and that certainly has had an implication. The, our staffing costs have increased because the, we're having to pay the staff, like our direct support staff more when we're able to safely have them in our home for the limited of it we do. And as well as their increased salary, we also are having to purchase fairly significant PPE for them to be able mm. to safely be in our home and us to be safe with them in our home. And all of that coming out of ODSP, which was below the stand, below a level, level of poverty before the pandemic has really, has made it extraordinarily challenging. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Crystal, can you also talk a little bit about the ODSP? Yep. Okay, so for many of us, we lost um, income a lot um, throughout um, with job-wise. My one job did not happen for two um, all through the pandemic, and then they had um, decided to let everybody go um, from the job. So I lost um, that job, and then um, my other job didn't happen throughout the pandemic, and my other one was kind of off and on, and the other one was more of a piecework so I didn't get a lot from that but um so many people with job loss can apply for CERB but if you're on ODSP the CERB is against you so you're getting the same amount ODSP and um but you can't apply for CERB to make up for a huge loss of income that you're experiencing with the job loss and with um less income Mm -hmm. which I think should we should be able to apply for it and still get it because we have still huge loss and things that still have to be paid for. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Ashley, did you want to talk about the passport funding? Um, yeah, so passport changed their guidelines probably about a year and a bit ago um, where you could, instead of using it to like go in the community, which obviously some of us can't do, at the present time, um, mm -hmm. you could buy things like a PlayStation or a computer, or for me, it was an iPod. Whoop de doo da day. That couldn't, that was like whoop de doo. That was only 300 bucks or something like that. And for me, I think I threw the receipt or something like that um, at dad and said, I don't want stuff. I'm not a materialistic person, but the iPod does help, you know, when I'm missing my friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about the impact of not having that person, that relationship? Ah, uh, well, that may, it put, I think it puts a strain on like dad and I, mm -hmm. I guess relationships, I guess. Um, and it's not fair to him, but, and, or me, and they just assume, oh, you don't need um, ABA or anything like that, um, or even respite care. You can just sit at home and watch cartoons or whatever you do all day. In your tiny little apartment, right? Yeah, in my three-bedroom apart apartment. Whoops, you do, da day. Yeah, and we really saw this being expressed as this able-bodied assumption that supports that are specific for persons with disability are seen as a privilege. Um, yeah, the right. It was like how I thought of it is like I think of like with the mind of a person with a disability. I thought, well, how come those able-bodied people get to go to I don't, I don't know, let's say Zares, for example, and get A, B, C, and D, and I have to stay home and watch TV. Mm -hmm. Can I read your, uh, or do you want to read your interview quote there? Sure. It says, able body assumptions for that support that are, that are specific for persons with, with a disability, uh, 
was seen as a privilege rather than a right. Um, and my quote says, I didn't think it was fair because I saw people doing silly stuff on, like on the internet and what and what and what it's and it's like why can't I have my support worker how all of a sudden is she not important yeah all of a like, sudden how does, the, how, how does some big wig in Ottawa or Toronto or wherever he is uh, decide that she's not important mm-hmm and the picture that you've talked about here in the past is um, the thought of not being able to have that worker and that profound, uh, that face just, I think, speaks a thousand words. Oh, yeah. I, after dad took that picture, I cried and cried all day. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an iPad go flying or something? I, uh, my, as we say in my house or like when my support worker is here, uh, things grow wings. So my, uh, my little, um iPod, which is probably about this size, you can see the camera, um, kind of grew wings and flew across our apartment because I was just so fed up with people thinking that they're better than us as like people with disabilities. Absolutely. Oh. Um, participants also talked about a lot of different barriers that they were experiencing uh, during COVID. Um, instances where their autonomy was restricted because of these assumptions. Um, for example, this uh, picture of the, the fire alarm was going to go off for th- unpredictably for it within a three hour period. Um, and Ashley, you talked about that that was extra challenging for you because of your sensory um, challenges, that it's even more ab- aversive for you and to not know when it was going to happen and to not be able to leave because you were stuck in your apartment. Yeah, so literally. <laughs> If this place was to catch fire, I'm literally stuck in my apartment. Um, and I don't always know that there's things posted because I don't go out in the halls much because it's gross. So sometimes, like, obviously, when my PSW comes in, she'll say, hey, this is what's outside, which is awesome. That's I think that's amazing that she does that. Um, or sometimes, like, dad will be the first to grab it but sometimes you get maybe 20 minutes notice and sometimes that's not I like for example yesterday I went down to mail a letter and I saw that and they were just getting ready to call the fire department here in St. Catherine they're like like how, when is this going to happen because I have to get upstairs because the elevator elevator will stop mm-hmm. thank you did it again. (laughs) So one of the other themes that really was predominant for uh, these individuals was a lot of the losses that were associated with the social distancing and and the lockdown. Uh, So the first one that was really talked about were the losses that were associated with those exacerbated risks that we talked about earlier. Um, So knowing that, you know, vaccine doesn't provide a full relief from COVID or the risks or, or the fear of COVID, Um, You know, people really felt their losses around their family, their friends um, work. And as one of our participants talked about just that feeling of, of being safe. So not, you know, going the last two some odd years without having a moment of feeling safe uh, in their current world. Uh, This is one of my favorite quotes uh, from one of our interviews Um, So we were chatting a little bit about COVID-19, obviously, and this couple talked about how they would rather have a zombie apocalypse than COVID-19. And so they say, um, it's kind of like the COVID apocalypse, because same thing, if there's a zombie apocalypse, you stay away from zombies, stay inside, and it's the same that we are doing with COVID. But you can't kill the COVID, but you can kill zombies, get them in the brain and they're dead. So which is worse, asked um, Laura. And she said, I will do zombies instead of COVID because you can't easily, you can easily outrun the zombies because they're slow. You can even go to the stores and hide from the zombies, but you can't hide from COVID. No, it's everywhere. You can go on the bus when the zombies are out. You can go into stores, you can go into malls, you can go to friends' houses, but with COVID, you can't do that. So I'll have the zombie apocalypse 
a pop apocalypse story than COVID. I watched The Walking Dead. I know how to deal with the zombies. Which I think, you know, it's just, it's so clever and completely accurate. Right? Yeah. One of our other participants talked about missing their family. Um, so from, I believe this is from their journal, right, Laura? Yes. Yeah, so from their journal, they said, this is my newest extended family. My sister and sister-in-law are both going to have babies this year. I will be a four-time uncle soon. I won't get to see my new nieces or nephews until COVID is over. I have another sister and brother-in-law and two nieces. I couldn't see them, and I couldn't see my grandfather at Christmas. I felt like something was missing. We also had, I'm sorry. It's been a long week, folks. I'm awake. It's all good. Um, so we also had individuals really talking about missing their friends. Um, one of my favorite pictures is actually down there on the bottom um, with one of our participants holding uh, a picture of their best friend who was also a participant in this in this project. Um, a little cardboard cutout of them to to show that they missed them. So there's there's actually two of them in both of these pictures. Um, so one of them says that during, during the pandemic, I have missed the close relationships I have had with my friends and family. I'm a hugger. I miss feeling happy and giggling with my friends. I miss baking with my aunts. Um, I know, Ashley, you had talked a lot of also about missing uh, the relationships with your support workers. Um, I know you chatted a little bit about it uh, further up, but did you want to kind of address that a bit more? Well, sure. As I said, like before I went all this, these new passport rules, I guess they're not really rules, regulations came into play about a year and a half ago. I kind of just looked at the paperwork and tossed it on dad's desk and said, I don't want stuff. I want my support worker. Although like some of the stuff like my iPod does help take away the pain. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, it's kind of like taking a Tylenol sort of for a headache. Helps with the symptoms, but not the disease. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. It, it helps you to stay connected in some ways, but not necessarily in the same way, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and these pictures here are you actually finally getting a chance to see your support worker after almost a year. Um, oh, yeah. And how incredibly happy you are. But other participants are still only seeing their staff and continue to see them only online because of those increased risks. Participants also talked about missing work. Um, and one of the things that um, really stood out to us was the fact that um, the vast majority of the participants didn't lose their job because of the employment itself. They chose to no longer go into their work because of the increased risks that they were experiencing. So the vast majority decided that it wasn't going to be safe for them to go to their job anymore. For example, individuals that worked at Value Village or grocery stores, even though they were still operating because of the increased risk. Crystal, do you want to add to that? So I just got a new job actually before the Sam Dynamic um, at the bowling alley. So I've worked some of the pandemic, but not as much. I'm able to work still, but they didn't always need me because the last work we had to shut down the bowling section because of the restrictions and everything like that. So we could only run um, takeout for restaurant wise and some of the other stuff was services wasn't happening. So now I'm starting to get back a little bit more because we had the mini pot going, ice cream and um, bowling going more. Um, so it's kind of between, sometimes I was working a bit of the COVID and then sometimes they wouldn't need me because lack of um, stuff happening. So they didn't need as many employees and then somewhat back. So, and I love my job there and I'm hoping to be back more soon and um, look forward to it, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So in addition to missing work, our participants also talked about missing their, you know, typical recreational as well as social opportunities. Um, this picture down in the far right corner, I think, is really impactful uh, just with the way that it's been set up with the cold snow. It really, I think, captures that loss. 
We also had participants talk a lot about their loss of opportunity to be able to be seen um, through things such as awards and recognition. Um, and there's a lot of value there for our participants in terms of being seen um, you know, on a regular basis, but that value seemed, those opportunities seemed to lessen, I guess, through the pandemic because they were not able to uh, get that same recognition. Mm -hmm. And it was not just about their recognition for what they're doing, but it's also a lot of the participants were giving back and they're volunteering. Mm -hmm. so they had lost those opportunities to give back um, to their community. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, there was a loss of just authentic engagement due to the distance that needed to happen for our participants. Uh, again, going back to those exacerbated risks uh, for them based on their medical needs. So you can see in all of these pictures uh, that individuals are really having to keep their distance from their loved ones um, and their family and their friends. So much more difficult, I'm sure, as all of you can relate, to um, actually authentically engage with people when you are at a distance, well, such as you can see in these pictures. The next slide we have Zade um, talking about uh, just a loss of being able to get out there and be traveling. Zade, did you want to read this part of your journal? Yeah. I'm go, go gadget voice. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love traveling. The plane I wish I was on. I love traveling by foot, by wheelchair, by bike, by toboggan, by canoe, by train. Sorry, I'm, I just have to move it so that I could see the, all the words. No worries. There we go. By train, by boat, by plane. I love exploring the world beyond the small safety of home. COVID has snapped my world shut and made it so small. I hate being trapped by a virus. Now, instead of being able to go on a plane, I can only see them up in the sky. I wonder if it will ever be safe for me to fly somewhere again. Instead of being able to go on a train, I can only go to the train station and watch the trains come and go from the safety of the van. I wonder if it will ever be safe for me to go on a train again. Mm -hmm. Instead of being able to go in a canoe or a kayak, I have to wait until it is safe to have people that we do not who do not live with us close enough to us to be able to help launch and dock as we need an extra adult. Instead of being able to go on my Team Hoyt bike and run events, I just have to look at the pictures and remember. I wonder if it will ever be safe for me to go in a big race or bike event again. This pandemic is cramping my style. I miss being able to travel. And maybe even more than missing traveling, I miss feeling safe. Some days I really wish I was on that plane. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that part of your journal, Zade. We also found that participants had a real loss of opportunity for being able to grieve their loved ones that had passed away either just prior to the pandemic or during the pandemic itself. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of us were feeling this, but we were able to make some connections with our families throughout this. A lot of our participants talked about the distance and not being able to make those same uh, connections and have those opportunities for grieving. Uh, the fourth main area that we saw um, really ex explore over the course of the pandemic was the participants' changes in their relationships with other people. Um, the participants, particularly those that were living together, reported that they developed a much stronger relationship, being able to support each other during these challenging times and being able to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, one thing that we thought was really interesting is that a lot of participants developed this bond with their families um, and continued to deepen that um, through watching those professional sports. Typically, they might have gone out and gone, gone to the stadiums and watched with different people, but by being forced to be at home, they got to share those experiences with their loved ones at home and developed even stronger bonds there. Some of our participants also established new relationships over the course of the pandemic. 
um, which was really exciting, but it was very different than it typically would be. Uh, so for example, the participant said, my new relationship has been a distance relationship. We deliver gifts to each other. We visit in the driveway. We get to know each other over FaceTime and text. And this is um, at Valentine's Day, delivering those special flowers. <laughs> All of the participants talked a lot about the changes that they experienced with their parents and their caregivers and some of the challenges that were associated with that dual role because no longer did they have supports coming inside from outside um, to provide some assistance with daily living or some support throughout the day. We saw that play out and impact the relationship that they had um, with their parents and with, the, with their adult child. So there's a lot of fatigue associated with that and challenges that they experienced. Um, as one parent discussed, I think Dee is a little bit sick of me. Wouldn't that be fair to say, Dee, that you're a little bit sick of me? Um, when he finished high school, he was home for about six months and you could tell he was getting bored. And so I kind of think it's the same now. I think that Dee needs more than all day, every day with his mom. Because of his disability, he's not able to access things like social media, messaging, texts, those sorts of things that would have allowed me to stay connected with the people that I know. Everybody needs more than just their mom and their siblings. The participants themselves also expressed some of the challenges associated with that relationship. I know they all love them, their parents very much, but it can be a little taxing and challenging. Um, for example, uh, one a gentleman wrote in his journal, there have been some pros and cons to being home so much. One pro is that I get to work on my private projects. Another pro is that I got to work on this project with my staff. There have also been some cons to being home so much. I feel one or both of my parents are constantly nagging me or telling me what to do. I feel like my privacy is constantly being invaded. Before COVID, I had so many places where I could go and I got to see people and spend time with different people. Now, the only people I spend time with are my mom and dad. I am excited to get up in the morning, but I can't wait for this to be all over. I am a young single guy and I've had no chance to meet anybody during the pandemic. I am lonely. So the fifth theme in uh, that we found in these interviews was a lot of uh, new opportunities for individuals. Uh, so a lot of increased autonomy for Indians around independence or freedom to be able to decide and to do uh, what they wanted to do um, or learning new skills, for instance. We had individuals talk about how they had new and creative ways of staying active. Um, as one of our participants said, since the pandemic started, I've been finding new and creative ways of staying active. I've been walking and running. I've been taking Zumba classes. I've also been doing online power yoga and floor hockey and team practices. So you can see here, we've got lots of different ways of uh, staying active during this time. Additionally, they found opportunities for using technology and staying connected. And as somebody who loves technology, <laughs> um, this really made me quite happy to see that people had the opportunity to use technology to stay connected. And it's something that as hopefully the restrictions are lifted, um, people are still able to use that technology for creative uh, ways. We had a lot of participants talk about learning new skills um, and even strengthening some old skills. Um, I think just because we're short of time, uh, we did have a video here, Laura, do you want to play it or do you want us to kind of move on to the resilience piece? I'll just play one. It's like a couple of seconds. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> um, and I think it's really important that we highlight some of these, um, you know, pieces of individuals that have resilience. <laughs> I need some resilience too. That just scared me. <laughs> um, they also found a lot of creativity around their food. 
Um, so lots of opportunities for getting into the kitchen and baking and making meals. Um, and for some participants, they talked about how this really only came out of the pandemic. These were not things that they were doing prior to the pandemic. Our participants are incredibly creative. You can see all of the different pieces of artwork and crafts that they got up to during this time. Um, really, really quite impressive. Crystal, that is one pretty looking cricket you have in the bottom right yeah. corner. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I know we wanted to be able to kind of go through them uh, with more detail for you guys, but I just want to make sure we get to the last one on resilience. Um, because I think this is probably the most important message that you guys have for everybody who's here today. So I'm going to pass it back to Laura. I think definitely the participants continue to show us every single week how resilient they were. And this is thinking about resilience, not just about as somebody, a specific trait they have or overcoming adversary. Um, really, the participants found unique and creative ways of working with what they had and finding the most out of their life and being able to give back in addition to that, um, which was so profound that we saw. Um, they found multiple different ways of being creative and problem solving to, um, to be able to do things that they felt that were really important. And I'm gonna turn this over to Crystal because I think this is an important story to share. Okay, I'm. this is my jewelry that I make. I have my own business for about four years now and I'm go to different shows and travel on that wise. But with the pandemic, it was more of a challenge to find um, events in person. So I've um, created a Facebook page and a website, um, Crystal's Creations, and I have, um, found ways online to search out places and have some stores um, sell my stuff um, so that I could get out there more. But I was navigating it on my own because no one else um, to do that. So I kind of created ways and figured out ways to, and I did some fundraising um, throughout to um, my friend Mozenos with cancer a little over a year ago um, with um, a dear friend of mine. So I decided to raise some money for Turbinsky Cancer Hospital and some other fundraisers for my local food bank and other things. Um, Cause we are in tough times and to give back is important to our communities and to help others. Um, and with my home um, jewelry, it gives me, it shows my gifts and my talents. You know, it's not a diagnosis or what I live with. You know, that's important part of my life. But for me, it's being seen for a gift and talents and, you know, really getting to know me more as a person, people and stuff like that, meeting new people that way. Absolutely. Thank you, Crystal. Yep. You told us many stories about how you got to know each other. And what I find so profound of that is you talked initially about how you're also experiencing some financial challenges yep. um, associated with loss of jobs, but yet you're not keeping this money. You're also are giving it back to other yep. people. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And I think very profoundly in the adversity, um, the participants took time to find joy and took time to find um, the light at the end of some of the, these challenging experiences, doing things that, that they found fun. Um, and I know that every single week that we got together, we found the joy and we found an opportunity to, to connect with each other which is, I think, incredibly profound given these exasperated uh, situations that they're experiencing. And we really wanted to close um, this discussion of our themes with really highlighting the fact that although other people don't seem to be expressing this, our participants really wanted to make sure that it was very clear that their lives have value and they deserve to be heard and recognized. Um, Davian and Tara, did you wanna to speak to this? Sure. Um, I think Damien is very often overlooked. Um, Damien can't move his wheelchair to approach people. Damien doesn't communicate verbally. So you need to actually make the conscious choice to take time to approach Damien and to spend time to learn how he communicates um, because he does have something to say. Um, and I think he's a, I think he's had a pretty good life. He's, he tend, he tends to smile a lot and he's a pretty happy and relaxed guy. Um, but in terms of 
the general population. He, he really is often not approached. He's not spoken to. And at a policy level, I don't think that most people in decision-making positions recognize that there are children that were like Damien that grow up to be young adults and hopefully old adults, um, that those needs are just overlooked and they're not recognizing that people like Damien even exist. Thank you. Ashley, why did you want to be part of this research? Um, to try and maybe give others like Damien that don't necessarily communicate via words to say, hey, you know, they matter too. Like I find myself um, sticking up for others at, I don't know, let's say respite or uh, my day program just because I don't want them to like feel left behind or whatever. But in terms of this project, I just wanted something to do. I wanted able-bodied people to know what a, what a hellhole this has been the last 16 to 20 months. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Crystal, same question. <laughs> sure. Um, so for me, it was, I'm, I like technology and I was involved in a few other projects before in different ways. and. So I enjoyed that. And also COVID affecting my life in many different ways, um, that perspective. And just, I enjoy presenting and I enjoy um, speaking and, you know, my voice being heard because I was once that child that didn't have that voice. So being that voice for myself, but, you know, also using it for other people to have that voice, you know, maybe somebody's not speaking up and going through the same thing. Maybe they can relate to what I'm experienced too. Thank you. And Lynn, is the day, what are the final messages you want everyone to understand? Um, like my own to, or like I'm shake a child a being inside a shake of nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you know that yeah life matters to us that our our voices and our lives matter and that even if we're not sort of a a big population we you know we and our kids and our adult kids have a profoundly important place and mm -hmm. need to be seen, need to be heard and need to have their presence in the world honored. Thank you. What we kind of took about out of this project so far is that our participants and the uh, many disabled people live incredibly rich lives, many multiple living, and working in many jobs, volunteering, doing multiple social and recreational activities and have strong relationships with other people. And although the pandemic has significantly changed their lives, they experience the same challenges and lockdown and restrictions as everyone else and experience them the same way, if not worse, um, because of the exacerbated risks, limited resources and ableism and ableist assumptions. However, our participants and persons with disabilities are incredibly resilient. They look for opportunities to give back to society and engage in creative expression. It has been an absolute privilege to have this opportunity to get to know more participants and to be able to share their experience and their journey with everyone. We hope that by learning about their lives, everyone will um, begin to reassess the way they are contributing to society and how they can help to break down some of these barriers and help to develop a more inclusive society that's more respectful and um, considerate of other people. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Um, there's a link to our website. We also have a Facebook page. If you have any specific questions, that's my email address there. Um, we will also stick around and ask and answer any questions that the, the audience might have. Laura, 
but I, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Niagara Falls History Museum for um, allowing us to to share your stories with you and for the entire group for taking part in this. Uh, I think it's an incredible um, project that you've all worked on together and it's very clear how close you've all gotten through this process and um, I know I'm enlightened by what you've presented today and I hope our audience that has watched us through YouTube and through Zoom has had the same experience. Um, so yeah, I just, I wanna say thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to share this with you uh, today oh, and yesterday, or uh, sorry, last Thursday. Thank you. So I'm just checking questions. Doesn't seem we have any. I think we're, everyone is just watching patiently. So, um, but if, if anyone has questions past tonight, um, Laura's email is on the screen. So if you have anything you want to ask Laura beyond today, please feel free to reach out to her. Um, this presentation and the one from last Thursday is also uploaded on our YouTube and is on Facebook. So. Um, if you missed last week, you can also uh, watch that one there. So um, I just want to say thank you again uh, for, for allowing us to be a part of this. And, um, you know, all the best to everybody. You're all wonderful people. And I'm so glad I got to know you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just have a little chat comment. Anna says thank you. <laughs> oh, that looks like a question as well. Oh, oh yes, there is. Go ahead, Laura. What was the most important thing you learned? Um, I'm, do you wanna uh, learn as being part of this project maybe? And this is for our participants. Oh, quick. I think how to use um, like, the meetings and stuff to learn how to do it more and connect more with people um mm -hmm. and i think just how like ever about other people's lives and stuff like that we could learn so much from each other and i think with it all mm -hmm. actually i know with those pictures uh the cards we also, when, when they were meeting on a weekly basis, one of the participants showed that they were making these cards and sending them to other people. And, and you, you learned that from the other participants and started doing that to your friends. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I actually, the one that was pictured a couple slides ago, I actually sent that to Bristol, UK, which is where my runner is from. And a runner is basically somebody that runs for me because I have CP. So I am unable to run. Well, I can run, but I'll meet the floor. Um, and I also sent some cards up north to my family. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I would normally do. Because like, I find it very hard to sit and concentrate on something like that. Mm -hmm. Lana, today, what did you learn? I think one of the things that we learned was that we, even at a time where we felt that there was so much invisibility and so much silencing, that there were still people who were acknowledging our presence and our value and our importance. And we're profoundly grateful that Brock saw fit to support this research because there there was a lot of radio silence about our lives during this per period of history and that Brock saw fit to support that and that you and and Courtney and everyone put so much time and effort into having pr providing a way for voices to be heard was hugely impactful for us Thank you. It was humbling for us too to make sure that we were doing your voices justice or expressing your voices in a way that was authentic to your expression. 
And Damien and Tara? Um, well, from a, from a parent's perspective, um, what this taught me was that Damien could actually do it. When, when we approached the, the project, I, I was somewhat skeptical that Damien was going to be able to do everything that he needed to do and not have it be me doing it for him. So <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a great surprise for me. Um, and just a reminder that I need to not doubt or um, put limits on what I think he can or cannot do. I need to keep presenting those opportunities. Um, but for Damien, this has become his little social circle. Um, these are people that he has probably seen the most consistently through the pandemic. And um, he's a little quiet right now, but we've stayed on mute because he's sometimes quite excited to hear what everyone has had to say and has been talking through the presentation because he's just excited to hear and see everybody because we, we don't have that outside of this little group. So that, <laughs> that's been great for him. Thank you. Courtney, what did you learn? We got, and the researchers. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to pull myself together from everybody else talking. Um, <laughs> I learned that I need tissues whenever I'm around these individuals. Um, but no, I think for me, there's been a couple of things. One is um, I'm just really grateful to have had the opportunity to use this methodology. Um, it's one that I had as a student I've heard about um, and I've, I've known the um, possibilities that could come with this type of this type of uh, methodology, um, but I had never done it or seen it in practice. And so to just see um, having that ability to include these voices in this way, um, it just fills a part of my nerdy research bucket in that um, I've always been about wanting to capture people's experiences and just felt really limited by the traditional um, interview type of um, uh, research methods. So that's one. Um, two is I learned every time I met with these individuals, I learned something new. Um, they continuously challenged me and opened up my eyes to what was going on around us. Um, and I try and think that I'm a pretty open-minded person, but they reminded me on a regular basis that I am still able bodied <laughs> and I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> um, and I so appreciate that. I so appreciate those opportunities for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Courtney. I echo exactly what you just said. And I learned to constantly um, check your assumptions and, ch and challenge yourself to make sure that you are listening authentically and making sure that you're really understanding what it is they have to say um, because they have such powerful messages to share with everyone. We One do of the, have uh, a little comment here from Liz. She says, thank you so much for, for this presentation. Your participant stories were enlightening, informative and inspiring. Thank you for sharing your stories. It is a start to helping make the world more accessible and considerate. Thank you. Thank you. There's also another comment that um, love Damien's outfit, looking sharp. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's tired. He's tired. So are you. <laughs> so tired. <laughs> Well, um, I want to thank you all again for this wonderful experience. Please come back anytime. You're all welcome back to share more stories with us. Um, again, I, this has been enlightening to all of us. So thank you for opening your hearts and your minds and sharing with us. And we really appreciate it. So um, with that, I will wrap up the night. Um, good night, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good job tonight. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye, Courtney. Bye, bye. Hope to see you guys soon. Yep. We bye. need to get a picture before everyone logs off. Oh, okay. okay. Photo voice. If I'll, I'll keep it going for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish I had done my hair. Okay.
All right, three, two, one, cheese. Thank you. Courtney, you need some cheese with that wine. <laughs> This is no, I need some wine with my cheese. What are you talking about? No, you're good at the wine in part. There's no wine. I have no wine here. Your mouth. No, no, the other <laughs> wine, Courtney. Oh my god. What am I gonna do without seeing you guys every other week? My life is gonna be boring. I don't know. Right. always email you with like quotes and stuff like that. I loved it. This is a great idea. It Absolutely. Was funny. Somebody's cat was meowing through the presentation. Mine. <laughs> and mine. Yours, yours were quiet until right now. Oh cute. my god! And my child upstairs, just like doo, 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 doo. I took. I had to turn myself off and be like, "B, go get the cat." <laughs> 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 then they come downstairs and like, "What, mom? What's happening?" 